Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Cora and Paul, for organizing this and for inviting me to speak. And I uh, really enjoyed hearing uh, Beth's talk just now. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, uh, my own relationship to the natural world and then a little bit about my, um, my background and how I, how I came to where, where I am today and some of the obstacles and challenges that I, I faced along the way. So potentially seeing myself as a, a case study of, of, of someone of colour navigating lots of different uh, uh, issues and also in, in lots of different contexts, both in the UK and uh, around the world. Um, so I'm a, I'm a research scientist at, at Cambridge University. I'm an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, so I study the, the evolution of, of birds particularly, but also in general the evolution of, of biological diversity. So I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by, you know, when you walk out in the world and you see all these different forms and structures and colours and behaviours and things, and it's, to me, it's a, it, the natural world is a, a source of questions and inspirations and ideas, and, and, and for me a lot of the, the, the great mysteries of the world um, come from engaging with the natural world, be it here in the UK or when I'm traveling in other parts of the world. Uh, and one of the great things I found as well is that you travel to other parts of the world and you see things that are related to what you know here, and then you come back here and you see things, you know, even things like the robin, which many of you will know very, very well, is actually a member of a family that's main center of diversity is in, in Asia. And uh, so suddenly you hear this robin or, or the, the chetty's warbler that many of you may have come across. Species like this, you suddenly see these as, as representatives of other much more broader uh, phenomena. So this is, this is me um, at one of my, the happiest moments in my life. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was the happiest moment for the bird, but, um, but uh, so this is actually on a, on a mountain in, in Mozambique. And um, I was part of a, a, a team of people um, uh, it's an international team, so we had Mozambican, Malawian, uh, British, Dutch, American, and Belgian uh, scientists uh, all working together. Uh, and we were surveying these uh, um, forests uh, in this area of northern Mozambique that uh, was was very poorly known by uh, by ornithologists. It, essentially, no one had ever uh, noted down the recordings of the birds. And uh, in fact, even the people who lived near 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 the mountain. Uh, didn't know the birds that well there because uh, it, it was it was considered a, a sacred mountain and there was a sense that uh, that very few people went up there and so before we went up there we spoke to the the people in in the in the nearby villages and got permission to go up there and so it, it's always this incredible feeling when you when you enter a place and and there's and it's like a you know it's like completely uh, we don't didn't know what to expect. We know what was found on nearby mountains, and we had a sense of. So we were close to the Tanzania border, and so we had a sense of what was going to be there and what was going to be a bit further south. And um, in particular, one of the things that we suspected might be there was this little bird, which maybe to a lot of you looks like quite a sort of nondescript, uh, dull, dull looking thing, but it is actually a, a bird that's only known from from two mountains in the world. And each of these mountains have these little patches of rainforest at the top. And uh, somehow this bird ekes out its existence there. It's actually quite common once you get to the right place. And uh, actually, when you look at the evolutionary history of these birds, this is another um, outpost of, a, of an Asian family, which has a few representatives in Africa. And again, this is something I find interesting because it's a part of a general pattern. There's a, a few other species like that. And not many people know, for example, that there's a, a type of peacock that lives in the middle of the, the Congo rainforest, this, this outpost of a, of, of a family that's normally found in, the, in, the, in, in Asia. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that inspire me about the natural world and that led me to want to become a, become a scientist. Um, this is also another thing. So again, you know, you can look at this and think, wow, you know, it, it, this is just, you know, nature porn or something like that. But, <laughs> but, but what, 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 you know, and, and you, can, you can look at it at that level and enjoy it. But there's also um, this incredible crest that you see here. Nobody knows why this bird has this crest. You know? So you can look at that at, at an aesthetic level and really enjoy it. But you can also um, start to ask, you know, why does it have that crest? And uh, so this is, I should add, so uh, I'm, I'm a trained uh, bird ringer, so we, we put up nets to catch these birds and we're able to take measurements, put rings on them, and then we release them afterwards. But the only context in which this bird is known to raise its crest is when it's been caught in the hand and is being processed as, as a bird uh, 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 for measurements. Nobody's ever seen it in the world. Despite people observing its behavior in the world, no one has seen it flash its crest in the world. So it's, this is still completely unknown why it has this ridiculous crest, and this is a little flycatcher. Um, and here another, sort of the, the kinds of variations you see in the natural world that 
uh, for me, make it a great source of intellectual uh, inspiration. So this is a little hummingbird with a, a tiny beak. It's called the wedge-billed hummingbird. And it's also, you can see relative to my hand, I mean, those are my fingers holding it, and you can see its, its size relative to my hand. And then you, it, raises, it ranges from that to this other bird called the great sapphire wing, which as hummingbirds go is much bigger. And so then you ask, you ask yourself all these questions, why is one small, why is one big, where do they live, what, um, what are their evolutionary relationships one in, with one another, why does the beak size vary? And when you're thinking about beaks, there's this, it also has this ridiculous beak, this is called a, a buff-tailed sicklebill, and you can see it's got this, this strange overly exaggerated beak. And then you compare that, this is also a type of hummingbird, and you compare that to this bird, the sword-billed hummingbird, which has the, the longest bill-to-body ratio of any bird in the world. And in fact, their bills are so long that when they, when, they, when they perch, they can't perch with their head facing forwards. They have to perch with it facing upwards, because otherwise the moment would topple them, them forward. And when you see them flying around, it's like a flying needle that moves around the, the environment. So, so th this, is, this is really where I'm, where I'm at my happiest, is, is, is as, a, as, a, as, a, as a researcher, measuring, studying, asking questions, and trying to make, make sense of the, of the natural world. And uh, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of start off by giving you a sense of where, 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 where I'm at. Um, but a little bit of, of, of my, my, my background. So I, I grew up in, I, I was born in, in London and, and grew up in the UK. And uh, both my parents are from uh, South Africa. And I've always thought when, when people say that, they, they always say, I grew up in the UK, but my parents are from South Africa. <laughs> As if, as if there's, there's somehow a conflict there. And uh, so I always like to say I grew up in the UK and my parents are from South Africa. Um, and uh, so th th this is a photo of my mum my, 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 my and dad uh, taken, I think this was taken actually in, in Paris. Um, but so my, my parents both met at art school in, in Cape Town at, at Michaelis, Michaelis Art School. And um, my dad was the, was the only person of colour at the art school. So. In, in South Africa in the 1970s, uh, apartheid was in, in full swing. And uh, as I'm sure all you know, everybody was classified according to these very uh, limiting categories, uh, uh, or if you're white, in enabling categories. And uh, it's, um, my, my, my dad uh, came from a community that was classified as the, the, the Cape, the Cape Coloreds, um, which itself is, a, is, is an extremely artificial uh, ca ca category. Uh, as of course is, is the category of, of, of whiteness. So my, my mother's family are um, Lithuanian Jews who, who, who left uh, Eastern Europe during the, the, the pogroms. And the other side of the family were German Jews who, who left when the Nazis came to power in the 1930s. Um, so you can imagine that uh, for them, uh, that their relationship was, um, was illegal. And if I had been born there, in the words of Trevor Noah, I would have been uh, born, born a crime. And uh, that's why they had to keep their relationship a, a, a secret. And um, eventually, they, uh, in 1979, they, they left South Africa um, ostensibly to go and study in the UK. And they, they left independently of each other, each having gotten uh, positions in, in the UK to, to go and study. Um, and they didn't tell their parents what they were doing. And in fact, my, my dad was, um, was stopped at the border because he didn't uh, have, uh, have documents to show that he was actually going to study and they didn't believe him. And he was then, luckily, he hadn't gone directly from South Africa. He'd gone via, um, via Amsterdam. So they deported him to Amsterdam where Amnesty International uh, looked after him for six months until he could get the paperwork from the university to convince the authorities that he was, he was going to study there. So this is, this is a photograph of me, me and my dad. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is in, in, in Cape Town. And, and so there was always this, this, this thing, you know, when, when my parents left South Africa in the 1970s, there was no sense that whether they would be able to come back, and certainly if they started a family, if they could come back with me and what, uh, what I would, re would represent there. And uh, it was only really, you know, it was only really in the, in the early 90s that um, the, the Immorality Act was scrapped, and then obviously in 94, Man Mandela came to power. So this is me aged about four, something like that. Um, uh, enjoying enjoying an ice cream with with my dad, and and, and I hope you can see actually uh, that my T-shirt already has birds on the <laughs> on it there. So uh, it was an auspicious start. Um, and th this is um, uh, the, the woman on the left is uh, my my dad's mother, um, who, who who was a uh, she, she worked as a as, as a as a cleaner. She cleaned uh, houses, 
and uh, the woman on the right, uh, Auntie Minna, was um, uh, not a relative, but uh, un unfortunately, my, my, my dad's dad uh, ha had serious problems with, with alcoholism and wasn't able to take care of him growing up. So um, this, this Auntie Minna f formed a kind of a, a, a support network for, for my mother. And, and so the other interesting thing as well is that you know, even within my, my father's family, there's a lot of complexity there. So uh, I said that the Cape Coloreds as a, as a, as a category is a very sort of strange, uh, a strange one. So my, my dad's mother was what was called, was sort of the sort of whatever you'd call true Cape Colored, which was where uh, she, she descended from uh, the, the, the Khoi and the indigenous people of, of, of that area who had then uh, mixed to some extent with, uh, uh, with, 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 with um, some of the, the Dutch uh, colonists. And then my dad's father uh, came from the, the Cape Malay community uh, who had been uh, brought across as slaves by the Dutch uh, about three, 300 years ago. And so even within, even all these people were called coloreds, they were all Cape coloreds. And, uh, but even for my, for my, for, for my dad, um, it, it was seen that my father had really stepped, uh, stepped down by marrying my dad's mother because um, uh, he, was, he, he came from a, a Muslim background and my dad's mother came from a, a Christian background. Um, and so already that my, my dad, I think, grew up with, with, you know, you can always draw smaller and smaller circles. Um, and this, this, is, this is me with, with, my, with, with my, my dad and my grandfather uh, on, on a lawn in the, in the Cape Flats. Um, and, then, and, then, uh, and then with my mother's side of the family, um, this is me sitting with, with my mother in, in, uh, in Durban on a beach. And I was looking through these photos, and I thought what was quite funny is that I seem to adopt exactly the same pose. It's about, this is about 15 years apart in, uh, uh, in different contexts, but I sort of thought that was, that was quite interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, and so as I said, my mother's family uh, came fr uh, as, as Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe and from, and from Germany. And uh, the interesting thing is as well, you know, um, amongst Jewish communities, interest in the natural world is also very, very uh, rare. And I think for a lot of the similar reasons that, that Beth outlined earlier about uh, products of the Jewish diaspora often move into city environments. And, 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 and it's particularly in, uh, anomalous because, uh, you know, there, there are lots of, 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 of especially uh, people from Ashkenazi Jewish origin in, uh, in, in chemistry and physics and biochemistry and all these other areas of science. But if you look at ecology and evolutionary biology, you find very, very few uh, Jewish uh, scientists. And more generally, you find very, very few Jewish naturalists. So that's why I, I, was, I, was, I was very lucky. My, my, my interest in the natural world was, was formalized. I mean, as you saw, I, I was always sort of enjoyed being out in nature. But was was this relationship with my my grandmother uh, Cynthia Garb, and uh, it, I, I, yeah, so my grandmother um, was was also seen as very unusual in a Jewish community to uh, to be someone who was interested in going out exploring the mountains in Cape Town and hiking, and uh, so sh she herself was seen uh, some, somewhat as as an outsider, and. Uh, when I was about 10, I, I went to visit her and spent about six weeks with her. And she took me all around the mountains of Cape Town and the Flays. And, uh, and that was where I got absolutely hooked on the natural world and birds in particular. And, and I think what's quite interesting is as a counterpoint to, uh, I mean, I think we'll discuss more about these kinds of rural urban dichotomies and, um, and, 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 and these, uh, you know, often in, in, in a kind of in a UK setting, we often think that there's a lot of cultural diversity in urban settings, but relatively low biological diversity. And then you have, if you wanted to get, you know, the areas with the highest biological diversity tend to be areas with lower cultural diversity. But Cape Town is an example where you have uh, a biodiversity hotspot of global significance nestled right in a city environment. And um, so this, even though it might look quite plain to you, this, this is the the, the Fambos plant kingdom, which is actually the most species-rich plant kingdom in the world. And I don't know if you can see well, but in, 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 the, in the distance, sort of going down the peninsula, you can see the, the houses of, of, of Cape Town. So you have the, these mountains rising up. Um, but, and yet, though, uh, in a Cape Town setting, uh, in terms of the people who are doing most of the engagement with the natural world and the people who, say, write the books and uh, other 
are considered the, the leading experts, that there are very, very few people of, of color. So I, I, I think this goes to show that it's, it's not just about proximity to the natural world that is the, the barrier. I think, as, as, as Beth had talked about earlier, there's lots of other barriers that need to be overcome uh, in order to, you know, so here in, in Cape Town, you have, you know, millions of people going right next to possibly the most inspiring, by one of the most inspiring biodiversity hotspots in the world, and yet it's still a very uh, uh, limited subset of that of that population who actually uh, uh, goes hiking and engages with it a lot. And this is just a, just as a, as a case study of, of what's what's there in these these heathland areas. So. Um, the, the Cape uh, province is very well known for its, its orchid diversity, particularly terrestrial orchids, ones that grow from the ground. And again, this, this, this is the kind of stuff that really made me think, I, I want this to be what I spend my life doing. So on the right, you have a, a type of dyser orchid, which is only found in, uh, on a particular area of Table Mountain. And, and it's called the drip dyser because it likes these little seepage areas that run down, um, uh, run down the, the, the rocks. And I don't know if you can see that it's got, so you have the flower and then coming out from behind the flower, you have this very, very long spur. And that's because it gets pollinated by insects which have very long proboscises. And so there's all these co-evolutionary interactions that happen between the insects and the plants. And that's something that fascinates me as well as understanding plant diversity through their interactions with insects. Uh, the one in the middle is, a, is an orchid um, which only comes up after fire. So we were very excited to, to see this because its seed sits in the ground dormant for many, many years, and then a fire comes through, which is a natural part of the Feinbos dynamics. And then this, this, this strange thing sort of comes up, and it hardly looks like an orchid even. And then this one on the right is, a, is, a, is another specialist that comes out of rocks. Uh, that you've got, but it likes these damp areas. You can see there's this very dense mat of mosses that, that, that live beneath it. So from this... Um, this incredible biodiversity hotspot. I, I then had to go back to uh, to school and to and to and to the UK. And and this this was the kind of you know landscape that I that I that I grew up in. And I remember having first been turned on to the natural world in in in, in South Africa, uh, and then live, growing up in 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 central London. Uh, I, I, you know, initially I sort of felt this sense of despair of you know how was I going to find nature in in all of this, but. As, as, as Beth has shown, shown earlier, you know, e even though at, at first glance this can seem like a, a just a sort of concrete jungle, there's there's actually even within a within a London context and certainly within a within a UK context, huge amounts of biodiversity that that you can engage with. So just as as an example, I was just showing you orchids in South Africa, and uh, and, I, and I constantly my, my South African colleagues are always telling me that. Um, oh, the UK doesn't have much to offer with orchids. Um, but this is a beautiful species called the, called the early spider orchid. It's one of the first orchids to emerge in the, in the year. And you can find it on the south coast of Britain uh, on this little reserve called Samphire Ho near, near Dover. And so you can see there's, those are the white cliffs of Dover in the background. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I hope one day that these early spider orchids will become as iconic as those, uh, those cliffs in the background. And this is me um, again in my sort of favorite favorite pose, um, like trying to trying to photograph these things. And uh, yeah, again, this is this is also me at me at my happiest. Um, and and here's a close up of it. And so again, you know, you could also just look at this and say at an aesthetic level and think, wow, look, it's amazing. But you know, there's all these interesting evolutionary stories behind it. Um, so this actually employs mimicry. It it it, re it emits these pheromones that mimic the sense of a female bee. And the male bees come looking for mating opportunities and try and mate with that uh, large swollen um, lip at the bottom there. And in mating with it, they get the pollen deposited on them. So there's fascinating stories of mimicry and deception. And uh, so then I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the work that I, I do currently. So again, as an example of observations that inspired uh, research programs, uh, this was the, my first sighting of, of a strange, ob uh, strange thing, observation like this. This was actually um, in, in, in Vancouver, walking through a, a pine forest, and I heard this strange, uh, uh, loud sort of uh, begging call. And I saw the bird on, on the left um, screaming and screaming and screaming. And eventually this bird on the right came, and as you can see, they look completely different to one another. And 
what this is is an example of uh, what's called brood parasitism, where the bird on the left is what's called a brown-headed cowbird, and the one on the right is the parent, the, which is called a black-throated gray warbler. And this cowbird has somehow tricked the parent into feeding it. So cowbirds are species that don't make their own nests and instead lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And this, um, uh, this, this, this parent has been duped into feeding it. And so in a UK context, this is the kind of image that, that you might have uh, come across before, where you've got this absurd cuckoo, which is huge, being fed by this little, little reed warbler. And so I was fascinated by these things and learned a lot about them. But I was also very interested to learn about it uh, in other parts of the world. And actually, um, uh, the areas in Africa, particularly Africa south of the Sahara, has some of the highest diversity of species that behave in this way. So I just want to quickly play you a few calls just to give you a sense of... Um, uh, many of you might be aware of the... Um, sorry, I seem to have lost the mouse. Oh, there we go. So this is a call that many of you will be very familiar with. This is the common cuckoo. Um, I don't know how you... I'm not really sure how you stop it, but... Uh, <laughs> But if you go to, to Af well, if you go in large ranges of Africa, south of the Sahara, there's another species called the African cuckoo, which... So you can see it's, it's quite similar, but the, the, the two notes are a little bit different. Um... And, then if you, and then if you go to Madagascar, you'll find another one. And again, these all three look very, very similar to the other, but you can hardly tell them apart visually, and they all have these different calls. And each one of them lays the egg in the nests of different species and have whole ranges of interesting biology to uncover. In fact, the Madagascan one, nobody knows what it lays its egg in the nests, in nest of, so there's whole worlds to discover. And just quickly, I'll um, show you a couple of other images here. So um, the other thing that I study a lot is, is, is the evolution of mimicry in the natural world. And uh, so on, 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 on the, on the left-hand side there, you can see this is a clutch of this bird called the, the fork-tailed drongo. And the two eggs on the right are the drongo's own eggs, and the one on the left is the one laid by the African cuckoo. And you can see what a good match it is. And the moment it hatches, it then pushes out the nests, the, the eggs of the other ones. And, uh, and then you get these ridiculous images of this African cuckoo being fed by a fork-tailed drongo. Um, and these are just a few of the other the other uh, birds that I study with their, these incredible diversity of appearance and, and colors. And just quickly, I, I would just um, want to show you one thing. So, um, so I, I then, uh, do, uh, in order to study this, I, I spent, I've spent a lot of time in Zambia and Mozambique. And, uh, and that's allowed me to en engage with people from, from lots of different backgrounds. But also you have, what you have to do there is you have to integrate with a very different uh, world. It like, feels like living in a different world. So especially in parts of rural Zambia, there's still very much these kinds of uh, uh, farmer-worker dynamics, often with, with white farmers and, and black workers. And you're, you, you then have to sort of, um, you sort of work between these worlds and within these worlds. And it's always this delicate balance where, on the one hand, you, you're, you're reliant on people for their hospitality. And on the other hand, you don't want to be complicit with certain modes of being that you don't agree with. And of course, for me as well, one of the, 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 the things that I'm constantly confronting is that as I move through the world, uh, people project on me different uh, cultural and ethnic identities. So in, an, in, a, in a Zambian context, certainly for, for most black Zambians, I'm just white. There's like no questions asked. It's like I'm just the, I'm the white guy. And, 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 and that comes with it you know, in some situations that might lead to certain, um, uh, make certain interactions easier in some situations it makes interactions harder but it's it's always very difficult for me because I'm never quite sure which identity is going to be thrown at me as I move through the world uh, when I've done work in South America people thought that I was some sort of Colombian and when I've done work in Greece they thought maybe I was some kind of Greek then uh, then here but, but but the thing is that here in Zambia the 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 the, the, the category of colored still and uh, not colored as in cape colored as in, as in colored as in mixed race still means a lot and there's still huge stigma around uh, mixed race marriages. And I think I, one of the things that I was very lucky with is that I grew up in North London uh, and already start, uh, where, 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 where these mixed race uh, couples were, weren't as uncommon as they are in, in, in rural Zambia. 
and my interest in the natural world began so early that I was already so fully committed and into it that it was only in my teens that I kind of looked up and I had these conversations with people where I told them that my one my father was Muslim my mother's Jewish and they said to me oh is there is there a war happening in your house L literally and and I, and I sort of looked at them confused um, so th I, I think that that's been something that I found very interesting is that's how just how, how how the projected identities are so fluid and yet when people when people assign these identities to you they do it with absolute certainty and, and conviction um, Cool. So I'll, I, I just want to finish on, on one note with um, this, this. This is uh, Lazaro Homosakili, who's uh, one of the main people I've worked with in, in Zambia for the last uh, seven years. And uh, he's, 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 he's one of the leading experts on the birds of Zambia and on the, um, particularly their nests and their eggs. And, uh, and he, um, I've, I've learned a huge amount from him. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I just wanted to, to finish, finish, finish on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you.